once again, thank you all for being here this morning at Hope Community Church. Always great to have you with us. Uh, this morning, we are in part three of a series that we're calling Below the Surface. That's what we're calling it, right? Below the Surface. And during this series, we're taking a look at a very big issue. We're looking at the issue of homosexuality. But more specifically, we're looking at why it is that Christians seem to be divided over this issue. Within Christianity, we have these two clearly um, defined camps. We have Christians who are very much in support of of same-sex marriage and believe that homosexual relationships are equal to heterosexual relationships. And then you have another camp of Christians who feel just the opposite, that those relationships are not equal and not entitled to the same rights. And so we're trying to figure out, well, why is this? If we're all claiming to be Christians, if we're all claiming to be following the same leader, following Jesus, then why are we going in different directions when it comes to a very major issue. And so the idea behind this series is we have this big issue up here of, of you know, same-sex relationships, but underneath that big issue, we have all these other issues underneath. And our misunderstanding of some of these issues underneath has led to our division up here at the top, if that makes any sense. And so just to recap for you a little bit where we've been so far, you know, first week we talked about the fact that if we're going to have a debate, if we're going to have a fight over this issue, then let's fight fair. Let's not just try to tear down one another and tear down the other side and make other people look foolish. Let's actually approach this conflict with the intention of resolution. That's what would be pleasing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's work towards resolution. Last week, we talked about the nature of this debate. Why is there a debate over this issue? Well, clearly because some Christians think homosexuality is wrong and some do not. That's why there's a debate, right? If we all thought it was wrong, there'd be no debate. If we all thought it was right, there'd be no debate. But we have this division because some Christians think it's wrong, which leads us to the question, well, who decides? Who decides what's right and what's wrong? And again, if you missed that that message last week, you can check that out online and listen to that. But basically what we arrived at is this. I mean, it's so difficult for for an individual to determine for himself or for herself what's right or what's wrong. It's it's challenging. It's, It's dangerous to let yourself be the final authority. It's also dangerous to outsource that responsibility to somebody else. And so where we arrived is that if, and I know this is a very big if, if God really does exist, then he decides. If God exists, then he decides. If God exists, then he decides what's right and what's wrong. And the thing about the God that we meet in the pages of the Bible is that that God cares more than just about what's right and what's wrong. Oh, yes, he cares about right and wrong, but he cares more than just about that. The God of the Bible cares about what's beneficial versus what's detrimental, what's beneficial for humankind, for the human species, for our flourishing, for our prosperity. He cares about those things, not just right and wrong. It's about what's beneficial and what's detrimental, what will lead to our flourishing and what will lead to our downfall. That's, that's what God really cares about, at least the God that we meet in this book. And so we arrive at this, this morning's message, which we're calling a very old book, and in this message we'll be talking about the Bible. Now some Christians, this is in your notes, some Christians believe that the Bible is the Word of God. The Word of God. Now, what that means, I mean, you could just throw that term out there, but let me, let me put some definition to that, because you could say, oh, the Bible's the Word of God. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. It just means something. They told me that in Sunday school. Whatever. The Word of God, when we say the Word of God, we mean this. It's the final word on God. This is God revealing himself to us. This book, this collection of text accurately reveals the mind of God to us, the heart of God to us, the will of God to us. This book accurately gives us God's boundaries and his his instructions for how we are to live, his rules for what we are to do and what we are not to do. This really is the final source on what's right and wrong. That's what we mean when we say the Bible is the word of God. Now, if, again, a very big if, if this book really is the Word of God, then we have an incredible resource at our fingertips here. We have the final authority concerning all things. You know, just about any question you have in life, maybe not all the little specifics, but you can take the broader issue, take it to this book and find some insight, find some direction, find some wisdom, figure out what is beneficial, what is detrimental, what is right, what is wrong, what is wise versus what is foolish. This is an incredible resource if this actually is the Word of God. Now, right there, I said that some Christians believe that the Bible is the Word of God. As I was making up these notes, I originally put some people believe that the Bible is the Word of God, but I wanted to get more specific because there is kind of an idea out there that, well, all Christians believe the Bible is the Word of God, and that's just it. Well, not all do. You should know this. 
Not all Christians believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And basically you have like three categories of Christians. You have people who do believe the Bible is the Word of God, Christians who do believe that this is the final authority. Then you have a group of people, you know, again, identifying themselves as Christians who say, okay, the Bible is a useful resource. You get some information on there, but it doesn't have to be the final authority. And then you, there's like a big group in the middle who kind of really don't know what, what they believe about this book. Like, yeah, it's the Word of God, but I really don't know what it is, and I don't know how to use it, and I'm not sure what it says, because I've never actually read it, but I've been taught that it's the Word of God. You know what I mean? There's like this weird kind of gray category of undefined what is this. Just to let you know, um, you know, the person who's talking to you, where, where I, what I believe, I do believe in God. Big surprise there, the pastor believes in God. And I do believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So that's my perspective, and that's where I'm coming from, okay? So that's where I am. Now, the question, if you're like me, if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, there's a question that we receive from critics, and it's right there in your bulletin. And this question, you know, the phrasing is a little bit different, but there's one major idea behind it. The question is, are you, you people who believe that the, word, the Bible is the Word of God, are you really going to let a 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life? I mean, that's the question we get from critics, right? And again, it's put out there in a lot of different ways, but it's just the idea of, are you really, I mean, like, this book is 2,000 years old, the last book, and it was written over 2,000 years ago. Are you really going to let a book that old inform you about how you should live your life today? So much has changed in the past two, are you kidding me? Past 2,000, so much has changed in the past 20 years. Are you really going to let a 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life and it's like, you know, it's, it, it's sort of a rhetorical question. And it's meant to say, like, that's, you know, what's built into that question is the idea is that it's foolish. It doesn't make sense to let a book that old tell you how to live your life nowadays. I mean, it's just, it's so dated. Think about all the advances in technology and exploration and, and just our way of thinking and our way to analyze things and all the discoveries. I mean, how could anybody let a 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life in this modern day and age? Now, like I said, you know where I'm coming from. I, I do believe the Bible is the Word of God, but let's just try to understand. I mean, I can see where our critics are coming from, can't you? I mean, I, I get it. It seems like, why would you let something that old tell you how to live your modern life? And so that's the question, and we're going to come back to that question as we... But it just, it's important to be able to see from the perspective. You know, those of us who do believe the Bible is the Word of God, see from the perspective of our critics. They're asking the question. And, and I mean, it, there's logic to that question, isn't there? I mean, can we, can we acknowledge that much? I can see why they're asking the question. And so we're going to come back to that, um, that question before we, we end today's message. Now, when it comes to the, pro- to, the, to the Bible, our biggest problem, what I believe is our biggest problem, this is in your notes, is that it is virtually impossible to read the Bible objectively. It's virtually impossible to read the Bible objectively. There is a, uh, a, a man named Timothy Keller. He's a pastor. He's an author. Um, I, I highly recommend that you, you look him up. Um, a wonderful thinker, uh, very, very um, intelligent. Uh, he put some wonderful ideas out there. And one of the things that he has said is that, you know, we have to be honest about this book. It's, it's really almost impossible to approach this book without bias. Because here's the thing, you're going to read what this book has to say, and you're going to want to believe it, or you're going to want not to believe it. Because there are all these personal implications in the text. This book is telling you how to live your life. And so you're going to want to believe it or you're going to want to reject it. It's like, <clears throat> in the way Tim Keller describes it, he says, you know, if you were a judge and, um, you know, somebody brought a case before you and it had to do with like a business that you were invested in, you would recuse yourself. You say, well, you know, I can't be fair. I can't be unbiased because I've got something to gain or something to lose in this case, so I'm going to withdraw. But when it comes to Scripture, you can't recuse yourself. You see what I'm saying? There are all these personal implications here. If you were reading a history book about, I don't know, like The Adventures of Young George Washington. Is that a book? I don't, it sounds like a miniseries. The Adventures of Young George Washington. But if you were reading a book about George Washington, that has nothing to do with you. There are no personal implications. You know what I mean? That book's not telling you, oh, this is how you receive eternal life or this is how you should live. And so you could read that book objectively. But the Bible's different because at a certain point in this book, you enter into it. <laughs> Because it tells you how to live your life and how you can be saved and how you can be forgiven and all these things. And so people come to this book and they're either going to want to believe it or they're going to want to reject it. 
Now, I've put out those two extremes, but what's really more likely is that if you read this book, you're going to want to believe some of it and reject other parts of it. I mean, that's just how it works. So it's very, very difficult to read this. I mean, I want to say it's impossible, but it's virtually impossible to read the Bible objectively. Again, those of us who believe the Bible is the Word of God, I think we just need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge it's very difficult to come to this book objectively. So let's take a look at what this book is. First off, it's not a book. The Bible is a collection. Okay, and so right there in your notes it says, The Bible is 66 books written over the course of approximately 1,500 years, 1500, by 40 authors. So bottom line, this is a collection of texts, and it was written over the span of 1,500 years, approximately, by 40 different authors. And so that's significant. It's significant to me because what we have here, even though this book was you know, compiled over the course of that many years and that this many people uh, you know, contributed to it, what we have ultimately is one story about one God on one mission. And so all these people came together to tell this one story. Now, the book is divided into two main sections. You have the Old Testament, which is before Jesus was born. This is in your notes. And the New Testament after Jesus was born. That's a, that's a kind of easy way to think of like how the book is divided. Old Testament before Jesus was born, New Testament after Jesus was born. Now, the Old Testament, again, I'm just trying to tell you what this book is, okay? People, that's oh, the Word of God. Well, what is it? The Old Testament um, primarily deals with this relationship between God and the nation of Israel. It's the story of God and his unique special relationship with this one nation, the nation of Israel. God creates this nation. He takes one couple and he builds a nation from them. And it shows you how he relates to this nation. And there's all these prophecies throughout the Old Testament about what God will do in the future, starting way back in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, when God plucks this guy out of obscurity and says, you're going to be the father, talks to Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And through you, I'm going to bless all people. Through you, I'm going to bless all all nations. And so you see the history develop of, again, this relationship between God and the nation of Israel. You see their highs, you see their lows, you see their backs and forths, you see how the nation of Israel sometimes rejects God as their king and as their leader, and then they experience downfall, and then they rush back to him, and he receives them. And you also receive these prophecies throughout the Old Testament, and it starts to become clearer and clearer what God is going to do in the future, that he's going to send the Savior into the world. And so that's the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, you have these different books, and they're plotted out there for you. We, we try to categorize these different books. You've got books that are filled with law, so it's the laws that God gave his people, a specific group of people at a, a specific time. We have books of history that, you, again, you could read just like any other history book. It's just recording what happened to the nation of Israel at different points in time. We have books of wisdom. Books that are filled with poetry, books that are filled with Proverbs. You even have a book called Proverbs. You have the book of Psalms, which is poems and songs. And so you have these books that we call the wisdom books. They teach us things. They teach us how to live wisely. (laughs) Live not as fools, but as the wise. And again, that's a reoccurring theme throughout Scripture is, you know, God challenges us. He encourages us to pursue living wisely. Do not live foolishly. Pursue certain things. Be wise. So we have these, these books of wisdom. And then we have books of, of, that the prophets wrote. Um, and you can divide those out to the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets wrote more stuff. So that's how you, <laughs> you can tell that. But that's basically it. You've got all these different kinds of texts. So it's not just one type of literature found in the Bible. Different types of, of texts, different types of writing that cover different types of things. And now, they're not clearly defined. You can read a book like the book of Genesis is often categorized as, well, this is a book of law. Well, it's also a book of history. You can read a book of wisdom, like, the, like one of the Psalms, and there might be some prophecy in there too. And so, you know, some of these definitions start to break down a little bit. But that's an overview of the different kinds of texts that we have in the Old Testament. Then we get to the New Testament. Again, that's when Jesus is born and from then on. So when we get to the New Testament, that starts with biographies. Sometimes these are called the Gospels. Books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the New Testament, they are the historic biographies of the life of Jesus Christ, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographies of Jesus. And then we have a book of history, the book of Acts. That's right after the Gospels, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. 
And that tells us the history of the early church, the history of what happened after Jesus was resurrected. What do the Christians do? What do the followers of Jesus do? That tells us the actions of those people, the actions of the Holy Spirit in the midst of those people. And then we have a bunch of letters, most of them written by a man named Paul. And so letters written by Paul, who was a, a, a prophet, a man of God, an apostle, whatever you want to call him, but he wrote to these different Christian groups advising them about how to live and what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. And then finally, we have a book of prophecy at the end, the book of Revelation, which is an incredible book. We talked about it once upon a time here, but tells us about what is to happen in the future. And so that's like the nuts and bolts of what the Bible, what the Bible is, what it's made out of. But what does the Bible claim to be? What does the Bible claim to be? This is in your notes. What it claims to be. It claims to be the inspired Word of God. In other words, this is not just a collection of texts. Right? It's not just like somebody said, okay, let's find all these old manuscripts and put them together and we'll call them the Bible at the end. Now, this claims to be, the book claims to be the inspired Word of God. Okay? Now, just because something makes a claim about itself doesn't mean you have to believe it. It really doesn't. I mean, I could claim to be the king of Spain. You're like, well, okay, well, we don't believe that. You know, just because it claims that doesn't mean we have to believe it. But that's what the Bible claims to be. Now, there are other you know, so-called, I don't know if you want to call them religious texts or sacred texts out there. They don't make the same claim. But this Bible is saying this is the Word of God. That's the claim it makes about itself, the inspired Word of God. Let me explain what that means. Take a look. If you want to just open your bulletin like this, take a look at your Bible reading for today. <laughs> from 2 Timothy. And so there's a little bit more of an explanation about what this book is, what this Bible is uh, in this book. Um, just to give you some background, this book, 2 Timothy, was written by Paul. This is his second letter to a man named Timothy, which is why it's called 2 Timothy. Very creative, these titles that we came up with, right? Uh, 2 Timothy, Paul's second letter to Timothy, and Paul was a father in the faith to Timothy. Not his biological father, but Paul was a mentor to Timothy. Um, he helped shape uh, Timothy's life. He taught uh, Timothy about Jesus, informed him about the Holy Scriptures. And so uh, Timothy is becoming a leader in the church, and Paul is writing to him, encouraging him, advising him, telling him what he should do and what he must not do. And so this is part of that letter that we have here, and this is what it says. And remember, this is Paul speaking to somebody that he's mentored and cares a great deal for. He says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. He's talking about what we're going to find out. He's talking about the Scriptures. He's talking about what we now call the Bible. He's talking about this book. Remember what you have learned from this book. Remember that you have come to believe this. You've, you've arrived at your own conclusion here. You've decided this, this is a reliable source. Remember the people who have taught it to you. Timothy had some people in his life and his family other than Paul that helped teach him this book. And can I just say how important that is? To have people help you along the way as you're trying to understand this complicated text. And so Timothy had people like that. Family members, and he had Paul who, who helped him understand what this text was about and helped him understand all the references to, to the birth of Jesus, all the, refer, all the prophecies about Jesus coming, and, and help him understand what salvation was all about. So Paul said, so remember all these things. Hold on to all these things. Verse 15, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. Even from a, you know, when he was a kid, people were teaching him from this book. And then verse 16, and this is one of these, you know, if you've spent enough time um, in churches or, or doing the Christianity thing, you may have memorized this verse even. But it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. God-breathed. That's an awesome, awesome term there. God-breathed. Now, in your bulletin, in your notes, I just said inspired, but, but see, to be God-breathed, it gives such a fuller meaning to what this book really is. God breathed it into existence. What it says is just what God wanted it to say. God breathed it. I mean, we don't even use terms like it. It's just such a powerful image. God put this thing together. He willed it so. He breathed it into existence. And then when we read the book of Genesis, we learn about how God breathed life into human beings breathed life into the first man in the same way he's breathing life into this collection of texts that we call the Bible. It's God-breathed, and it's useful. <laughs> it's useful for all these things. You know, other than collecting dust on our shelf, it's useful for teaching, 
for learning what's wise and what's foolish, how to live and what to pursue, what to do, what to avoid, what you must do, what you can't do. It's useful for teaching rebuking. Wow, that's uh, rebuking. Wow, yeah, rebuking. That's a heavy word, isn't it? For going into somebody else's life and saying, hey, listen, you're doing something foolish. You're doing something detrimental. You're doing something wrong. The Bible is useful for that. It helps us understand. Again, Paul is, is using this as the source. This is it. This is what you can count on. This is the absolute source of truth. This is infallible. You can use this. You don't have to come up with your own opinions about what's right and what's wrong. You don't have to go up to somebody else's life and say, well, here's what I think about what you're doing. No, you use this. This is what's useful for rebuking. Not your opinions, this. It's useful for rebuking, correcting, right? That's the idea behind rebuking ultimately is we want to correct, we want to help people. You know, you don't want to take this text and just slam people over the head with it. You're living wrong. Boom. No, no. You want to help people live in a way that's more positive, that's beneficial, that will add to their flourishing and enjoyment and prosperity and training in righteousness. I like that term training. You think it like the gym of working out, of building yourself up. You're building yourself up spiritually, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped fully prepared, you've got all the tools you need, fully equipped for every, every single good work that we have been commanded to do as followers of Jesus. That's what the Bible claims claims to be. I want to pause here just for a moment and and, and tell you something. Um, Some people have this idea that the Bible is just, you know, at a certain point in time, everybody just gathered up these texts and said, okay, this is it. It didn't happen that way. If you want to learn more about how the Bible was canonized, that's the term we use, how it was all put together, how it was sealed, how it was decided, well, these are the books, these are the, these are the Word of God, and these other books are not. There's an awesome book um, by F.F. F. Bruce called The Canon of Scripture. Again, if you want to check that out, it's, it's easily readable. It takes this complex issue and presents it in a way that's understandable. But ultimately, what you had is you have a collection of texts that all tell one story about one God, and there were attempts to, to compromise that. There have been attempts throughout history to, to take other texts and submit them in and eke them in and say, okay, well, this is the Word of God too. And so this book explains how those books were eliminated from our Bible. And so that's what the Bible claims to be, the inspired Word of God. So here's the big criticism about the Bible. I know they're like a bajillion little nuanced criticisms about, oh, you people who believe the Bible, and this is the Bible, not, you know, why do you believe that? But here's the big criticism. The criticism is the Bible is fake. All other criticisms revolve around that same point. Well, the Bible's fake. The Bible is not what it claims to be. You know, maybe parts of it, are, you know, do accurately convey some things that maybe happened in history. Maybe some of it is accurate. But overall, you've got human authors, and they're writing these books, and they're not exactly telling the truth. It's a fake. It's a forgery. Okay, that's, that's the biggest criticism about the Bible, is that it's fake. Does that make sense? And like I said, all these other nuanced criticisms come out of that one major thing. It's not real. It's not reliable. I mean, how do you really know that this book was written by Paul to Timothy? How do you really know that, that you know, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, how do you know that he wasn't just making this stuff up? I mean, he's claiming to see this vision. How do we even know it was written by John in the first place? It's fake. That's the criticism, that this book, that this collection of texts is fake. And so the question, and, and again, and again, you see the logic behind that. Can you see the logic behind that criticism? It's like, you're really going to believe what this book says about itself? I mean, are you really going to believe that? I mean, what if it's fake? And so the question that I have back to that criticism is who, this is in your notes, who faked it and why? Who faked it and why? Now, again, I understand the criticism. I understand somebody raising the question, well, how do you believe all this? And couldn't it just be a forgery? Couldn't this be fake? But who is the one, who is the mastermind faking it? I mean, maybe you could fake like, I don't know, one book. But could you, could you really? I mean, again, this book was compiled over the course of 1,500 years. You had 40 different contributors to it. It's 66 different books. It adds up to one story about one God on one mission. Who's the mastermind behind this faking it? I mean, what a vast, just really realistically, what a vast conspiracy that would have to be. What kind of organization, I mean, who, who could do that? Who could do that? And why? If you're going to fake something, if you're going to forge a text, you've got to, there's got to be an agenda, right? 
There's got to be an agenda. Here, I'm going to submit this thing. I'm going to call it the Word of God because I've got an agenda. I want to see certain things happen. I want to see certain things happen. I've got an agenda that I'm pushing it, so I'm going to claim it's the Word of God. Well, what's the agenda? Who faked this? And why? Now, you could try to come up with answers to that question. I'm not saying, well, you know, I got you there. No, no, no. I'm just, but that's the question I have. Well, who, 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 if it is a forgery, who is forging these texts and what do they have to gain from it? Does that make sense? I don't know. What do you have to gain from faking this? Now, there are other texts out there. Uh, some do claim to be the Word of God. For example, the Koran, um, the Islamic text, claims to be the Word of God. And just to give you, just for, you know, I don't want to pick on you know, our friends from different faiths and all this, but just to give you a point to, to compare and contrast, that text, um, its claim is that it was written, um, if you know anything about the Islamic faith or whatnot, and I'm not an expert, so if you know more than me, please correct me if I'm wrong, but basically you had a man named Muhammad, and he was having these cave meetings, religious meetings, maybe you would call them, and he claimed to be hearing from an angel. So God was speaking to an angel, the angel was speaking to Muhammad, Muhammad was speaking the words out loud, and he had his people frantically writing it all down. And so that's, again, what that book claims to be. This is one text written at one point in time, this is the authority. So that's what they believe. But you got one book written at one point in time. Now, see, when you compare that to a scripture that's like, this is how many different books? 66 different books written by over a span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, and it all adds up to the same thing. I mean, I just feel like there's a lot. I mean, this is my, this is my opinion. I feel like there's a lot more weight to that than just to take one guy's word for it. Oh, I'm really hearing from God. Do you see what I'm saying? And so when it comes to something like this, and you say, well, it's a fake, well, who faked it, and, and why? Does any of this make sense? I'm trying to read your faces. You're like, huh? I'm hoping this is getting through and making some kind of sense. I understand it. It's just tough to communicate. Sometimes I struggle with that. Um, but that's what it is. Again, you go back to that, and I can understand the criticism. Well, it's a forgery. Well, it's a forgery. Well, well who? Who and why? Who faked it and why? I want to tell you um, two reasons the two reasons that I believe the Bible is the Word of God, okay? So this is personal for me. You may have this in common with me. You may not. I don't know. The two reasons I believe the Bible is the Word of God, logic and experience. Again, one of the things that made the biggest impact on me is when I realized that this is a collection of many texts written by many people over a large span of time, a long span of time, and it adds up to one story about one God one consistent message about who God is and what he wants and what he wants to accomplish on the earth. And so logically, that logical part of my mind that can reason things out and say, okay, does this make sense? Does this add up? That's one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is the Word of God. But the other piece of that is is about experience. And some of you who believe the Bible is the Word of God, some of you who are Christians who have kind of tried to live by this book, you've realized this along the way. You read something in this book and then you put it into practice, and it turns out it works. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean by the experience part of it. I mean, in the book of Matthew, this is one of the most you know, famous things that Jesus talked about. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. He taught us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's what Jesus tells us. Seek him first, and he'll take care of the rest. And so some of you have experienced this thing where you actually, okay, I'm going to put this into practice. I'm not going to worry about my bills. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to follow Jesus. And you've seen that it really does. It works. You know what I mean? There are things like that. You put the teachings of the Bible into practice, and you see them work. I mean, if you want to try this for yourself, read the book of Proverbs, and then look at the world around you and be like, wow, this is exactly what the book of Proverbs is describing. You know what I mean? It just accurately reveals human nature to us. There's that experiential piece of it. Now, if it was just experience and no logic, you know, maybe you'd kind of, you know, be in a, in a bad way, but you've got two components there. It makes sense logically, I, I, I believe this book, and experientially, I've seen the truth and the reality of this book play out in real life. Have you ever had that thing happen? I was just talking in a small group a couple weeks ago to somebody like, yeah, we're talking about that. You learn a text, you learn something, and then you get a little bit older and you see it. You're like, oh, wow. Yeah, all right. The Bible really is the Word of God. And so those are the two reasons why I believe it. And so I have the question for you. Come back to that question of our critics. Are you really going to allow a 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life? Well, again, I'll give you my answer. My answer is, and it's there in your notes, my answer is conditionally, yes. 
Conditionally, yes. Am I really going to allow a 2,000-year-old book to tell me how to live my life? Well, if that book happens to be the Word of God, if that book happens to contain an absolute source of truth, then yes. Then yes, I will let that tell me how to live my life. And maybe that seems foolish to my critics, or maybe that seems, you know, silly, but I will. Because here's, here's the other thing, is like, what are my other options? If I'm not going to let this book tell me how to live my life, then, then who should be telling me how to live my life? I mean, every time I hear that question, are you really going to let a 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life? I think, well, as opposed to what? As opposed to who? You know, should I just let the popular opinion of the day tell me how to live my life? Should I, just, should I be my own decider of how to live my life? Should I, you know, outsource that to my parents and my teachers or my pastors and my priests or, or my, my, in my government? Who should be telling me how to live my life? If not the Bible, then, then who? If not the Bible, then what? And so my answer to the question is, yes, I am going to let <laughs> a 2,000-year-old book tell me how to live my life. I am, okay? And again, you might see, think that's silly, but I, what, else, what else do I have? <laughs> if this is the absolute source of truth, and I believe it is, if this book is infallible, and I believe it is, if this book is the Word of God revealed to us, and I believe it is, then yes, I'm going to let this 2,000-year-old book tell me how to live my modern life. And so I leave the question to you. Are you going to let this 2,000-year-old book tell you how to live your life? Now, some of you already know the answer to that. Some of you have already said, oh, yep, yep, figured that out already. Some of you may be uncertain of that. And listen, I didn't provide you this morning with enough information for you to make a decision. I really didn't. This was a brief overview of what the Bible is. I mean, come on. I'm not going to say to you, you got to decide right now for yourself. What are you going to believe? Are you going to believe this book? No, 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 no. But you, I am challenging you to ask yourself that question. Are you going to give, give the authority over this book? Okay, I believe this is the Word of God. You tell me how to live. Are you going to do that? And if the answer is no, you have to ask the question, then how are you going to decide how to live? How are you going to decide what to pursue and what to avoid, what to do, what not to do, how to relate with other people? If not this book, then what? And so I challenge you to think about that. Now, all this is all well and good. And again, it's, it starts with the very big, big if. If the Bible is the Word of God, then we use this as our absolute source of wisdom. But even if you come to, after you come to that understanding, there's another challenge that comes with the Word of God. And that's figuring out how to read this thing, all right? This is not like picking up the newspaper, right? This is not like scrolling online and picking out some. This is complex. This is a complicated book. Let's not pretend that it isn't. I hear a lot of Christians say, oh, just you got to read your Bible more, read your Bible, read your Bible more. I was in my 20s. Listen, I grew up in church. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that somebody taught me how to read this book, how to get the most out of it, because there is a way to read this book that will make sense to you. And if you just pick this thing up and start reading, it's like, oh, I don't get this. What is this? But there is a way to read this text, and that's what we're going to talk about next Sunday. Again, we're talking about all these issues because if we have some misunderstanding about these issues as Christians, it's going to lead to a division up top. It's going to lead to a division when we try to figure out the issue of homosexuality. But we've got to go back, again, underneath the surface of that big issue and look at some of these things. What is the Bible, and how do we read it? Because I'll tell you right now, and you've probably already experienced this to some degree, you can use and abuse this text however you see fit. It's easy to twist the words and take it out of context and say, well, boom, 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 the Bible says this, boom. No, 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 no. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we need to know how to appropriately use this book, how to read and study this text to find out what it's really communicating to us. And so that's where we'll pick up next Sunday. Let's close there. Father God, we do thank you for, um, we thank you for your desire to be known. We thank you for giving us the Bible. We thank you for giving us a way to learn more about you. We thank you for giving us a way to, to learn what we should pursue in life and what we must avoid. And Father God, help us, help us to value this resource that you've given us. Help us to appropriately use this text. You Father, so many of us in this room, we believe that it is the Word of God. So help us be able to use this for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Father God, I pray for, um, I pray for all the people in the world who, who struggle with this book, who struggle with the Bible. Pray that you would reveal to them just what this book is. 
Um, those of us who, who have doubts and are struggling with our faith, help us to, to really lean into those struggles and to seek answers. Father God, ultimately, we just pray that, um, that we would allow ourselves to be open to what your word tells us, that whether we like it or not, we would allow your word to be the final authority in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.